Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be in South Africa again. I lived in your wonderful country for four and a half years, so it's always an honor for me to come back. I'm actually a permanent resident, which means I get to line up in the South African passports line, which I find very exciting, because otherwise I'm just EU or Dutch. But um, yes, yeah, so... I grew up in 12 different countries, and even though I'm originally from the Netherlands, I was born in Brazil, and ha having traveled quite a bit when I was younger means I saw the inside of a lot of classrooms. And no, I never stayed a grade. It was simply because every two or three years, we would move to a new country, a new continent. And originally from this fun little place, which I truly hold very dear in my heart. The Netherlands is a wonderful country. I actually only lived in my home country for four years, from 14 to 18. So it's a little bit of an identity thing. Um, originally from Brazil, um, I've lived in uh, South Sudan, in Bangladesh. Now there's some little kiddos here, but that's me. Singing enthusiastically, but perhaps not as enthusiastically as my Korean classmate. Love it. Uh, Kenya. And Senegal. And um, I just want to just go back to Sudan quickly. I was living in Juba, South Sudan. And during this time, it was the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement between the North and the South of Sudan. And at the same time, Darfur conflict was happening. So... Most of us were across what was happening in Darfur, but had less information made available to us about the conflict between the North and the South. It was actually a really difficult time in Sudan. I was there for the UN um, High Commissioner for Refugees. So um, being in South Sudan at this time, obviously the future of these kids is pretty bleak, but at the rate that our education system is treating students globally, the future for most students is pretty bleak, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, <laughs> this South Sudan story is actually pretty funny. I was here teaching English for a while as well, and imagine, you know, the room was perhaps, like, I want to say maybe a quarter of that space right there, sand floors, some, some desks for some kids. It's fine. You know, it was hot, sweating, and there was this one kid, he was like four years old, his name was Mo, and he would just, if I wasn't looking, because there were 79 students in the classroom, he would just strip naked. <laughs> and then like his uniform would be in like a little pile on the floor. And you know what? I got it. It was so hot. It was so hot in the classroom, and it pained me to tell Mo to just, you got to put your clothes back on, buddy. You got to. This is school. This is what we do. And he was not interested. Another really funny story about South Sudan, actually. My co-teacher from Kenya she was like, good morning, class. They're good morning, teacher Kim. Okay, this is teacher Yos. Say good morning. Good morning, teacher Yos. And it was the cutest thing. 80 little voices at the same time. Didn't understand anything, but super enthusiastic. Now, my name actually brings me to another kind of interesting story because it's actually a city in Nigeria. And <laughs> this has a point because, um, first of all, that's funny. Second of all, this makes me laugh. I love grammar. I love grammar. And this comma here just makes me feel like somebody explained the instructions to me on how to get somewhere. But I, I didn't quite get it. Number nine, Amadou Bello Way, yos. Sorry, my generation grew up with Google Maps. Um, the real reason why I got into education is right here, University of Yos. Now, I couldn't find it in my files, but I promise you I have a picture of myself as a 10-year-old standing next to this sign. So um, I went there and I did a training in front of 300 people from Nigeria. Tough crowd. They were not that excited about having what they thought was a little American girl teaching them about marketing and communications. But I had to do my job. So I stood there and I told them, that my Dutch parents actually named me after a city in their country. And then I confessed that that wasn't tr the truth, but what mattered in that moment is that we had a connection. We built a connection henceforth, because I was able to make a joke and break the ice, because that was a difficult one. And what mattered for Mo in this classroom was freedom. 
And that's something that is so important. He didn't feel like being restricted by his uniform in 38 degrees Celsius in a classroom with sand floors. I get that. And a few years later, I found myself in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh. And I was there on a panel with some incredible people really doing amazing things. And this conference in itself, the conference we were at, was quite something because it was all about encouraging young women to step forward into the workforce in Saudi Arabia. Sounds easy, not so easy. And what I discovered during this workshop was actually quite heartbreaking because the questions I received when we were in a closed forum, so not in the panel setting anymore, was, I have a degree. I have nothing to do with my degree. There's nothing for me. And that really broke my heart because what mattered for these women was expression. What mattered was expression. So I started thinking about these things in education that matter so much, freedom to mow, connection in Nigeria, and expression for the women in Saudi Arabia, and even my own personal lesson in education, which is resilience. And like myself, you probably have your own lesson too, something that you take away as this bigger lesson in life that shapes you to being the person that you are today. And I don't believe that we really teach these skills or track these skills in the classroom in the way that we need to. And that's what fuels my passion to work in education, combining both that emotional intelligence and artificial intelligence to pave the way for new ways of thinking about learning. So we've got a world that's increasing at a rapid pace. We've got so many changes happening in technology, and I don't want to get into these now because we've already had so many fantastic speakers talk to us about artificial intelligence, about virtual reality. We saw it this morning about we have nanotech, biotech. There's so many changes happening at an increasing pace, but we are not actually building the capacity to keep up with the technology that we're building. So there was a really interesting point raised this morning about name one thing that doesn't become smarter when everything is automated. It was along the lines of that, and it was part of David's presentation this morning. And I just thought, well, humans, we won't become smarter when everything's automated. So where does that put us? That puts us in a very precarious spot where we actually need to think even more creatively, more collaboratively, and more critically about how we solve the problems of tomorrow. And <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's almost like a grocery list, but not quite as fun, because these are actually the things that we're trying to achieve. And that's a long list, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsibility, climate action. And we just saw harrowing stories coming out of the Amazon. My birth country broke my heart. I called my mom crying about it. That's how little, I don't know if you saw the picture of the one airplane, the one airplane who that had to do this impossible task of stopping this fire. It's heartbreaking. There's a lot of work for us to do. Now, I know that these challenges are on the forefront of the South African agenda and that sometimes it does feel like there's a big gap between what we can achieve, between where the influence and impact lies, and how we can really close that bridge. So let's think about some of the ways in which we can do that today. First of all, sustainability. We claim that we're working towards sustainability, but when we're burning down the Amazon to build farmland, that's not a very sustainable solution. So in addition to the fact that we're struggling to really handle all these challenges, we're also dealing with this education system that's failing students, not only because of the way curricula is de de delivered and content is delivered, but also because students are sad. Students don't feel happy. We've got mental health challenges. Students report being bullied, feeling anxious if their teacher doesn't think they're smart. Imagine sitting in a classroom and worrying about whether your teacher thinks you're smart. So we've got a big challenge on our hands, making sure that we can lift our global consciousness so that people have the power to step into that, their own personal potential, and do the job that they are born on Earth to do. Because we all have that within us. And I know I love that exercise this morning where you had to think about what you wanted to be when you were younger. And, you know, it was so fun because the people I was talking to were saying, but I, it's still my goal. 
It's, I'm still doing it. I'm still going to do it. And I hope many of you feel that way as well. Astronaut, trombone player, whatever it is that you wanted to do, I hope that still lives within you. Now, when I think about all these challenges that we have, right? So we've got those sustainable development goals, all those challenges that we need to reach. We've got challenges of the way that students are actually feeling in the classroom, and that's learners across the board. And we realize that our increasingly complicated world requires integrated skills while we've got our work cut out for us. Now, in addition to thinking back to what you wanted to be when you were younger, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to think about what you loved about school. Some of you maybe didn't love anything. I actually was that annoying kid that loved everything. So <laughs> I loved doing things like tackling problems with my classmates on different class assignments. I loved working in team. I loved musical theater. I loved sports. I played volleyball, basketball. I did whatever. I also got really bullied because I I did everything that I wanted to, that was difficult. But remember what it felt like to expand and to create something with your classmates, or even now with your colleagues? That's when we as human beings feel proud. That's when we feel we're reaching our potential and that our brain is actually being triggered into thought and creativity. But how do we get there? Because that lies in thinking about some very important things. So for me, that's resilience. Because although growing up around the world sounds really great, do not confuse it with travel. Travel is really great. Packing your bags to go on a three-week trip throughout Namibia or a road trip in the US or to explore Finland and Norway, yeah, that's travel, that's awesome. But growing up and having to move every three years from one continent to the other, is difficult. And although I wouldn't change it for the world, I'm not sure I would do it to my own kids. So resilience is my lesson. And that means that I'm very inspired to think about ways in which we can build systems of resilience, of creativity, of collaboration, and allowing a space for everybody to develop their full human potential while they're here. So my colleagues and I are working on building an operating system for human capital development. And that means that we use artificial intelligence to work with emotional intelligence hand in hand to understand where passion lies and to track that both on and offline. Now, we're all here today because of education. Informal or formal, school or street, private or public, what happened in the classroom or outside, it inspired you, and education is deeply personal for that level. So we've talked about training for a global system of issues that we're facing and trying to get us reaching these goals ASAP. Now, when we think about education and reaching those goals that I've listed, I want to also ask you to think about assessment. And working in education, I'm often asked about assessment. Well, I'm going to tell you that I don't believe in assessment and I don't believe in curricula. I don't believe in teaching that way. In fact, I really believe that a holistic approach to education through phenomenon-based learning, for example, which I'll get into in a little bit, really allows us to explore everybody's full potential. And that's true for the school, as it is for the workplace, as it is for a family or a village or a community. And we need to think about something. And I love this Jack Ma's quote. And these are from Jack Ma, the World Economic Forum, other leading thinkers on education. But if we start thinking that we need to teach kids to compete with machines, we have a problem. That's not what we're looking for. We are looking for ways in which to teach kids how to expand through music, through the arts, through games, through the power that they have within themselves that you have within yourself too. We teach values like independent thinking, caring for others, for the elderly, for teamwork. And you know, I love this too, because actually, despite some of the challenges as I've raised earlier today, most people do find some confidence in their national education system. And why? Well, because if we invest in that system, that is our biggest chance to ensure our country's future is secured. It's important for students to have soft skills because competing with machines is not our job. It's our job to stay human as we continue to develop machines alongside our progress. So I want to talk to you a little bit about phenomenon-based learning, which is a concept inspired by the Finnish education model, and I absolutely love it. Phenomenon-based learning takes a larger phenomena, removes curricula, removes traditional subjects, and teaches through that phenomenon instead. And it's really awesome because essentially what you could do is you could take something like time, you could teach it to a five-year-old by saying, hey, I'd like you to draw a clock. 
A clock is what we use to tell time. You could look at working with 16-year-olds and look at time and say, how about we look at the last 100 years and let's look at how incrementally or exponentially we saw change through time. And you could work with older students by thinking about, well, okay, time, what about the future of this country? Why don't we design a strategy that helps us build a stronger future? Do you see what I'm getting at? You take a larger phenomena, and through that phenomena, you teach different skills. And what's really nice about that is that everybody gets to play a part. Everybody gets to say, you know what I'm really good at? I'm really good at this. And I really like that. Oh, and this is my passion. And doesn't it feel good to be recognized for your passion? It does. This is a classroom from the 1800s. Students in rows staring ahead. And this is now, nothing's changed, except for the whole world has changed. It's colorful now, it's vers versatile now, and we need to make sure that we deliver both technology solutions, both on and offline, that can enable this future of learning. So phenomenon-based learning, as I mentioned, it takes care of all those subjects and rather looks at teaching through a larger phenomenon, which is super interesting and very engaging. It means that we can focus on taking education and technology and merging these hand in hand. Now, do I believe that technology can fully replace a teacher or learning? Absolutely not. In fact, a lot of what we do is enabled by technology, but encourages offline activity so that we can still track, we can still understand, we can still have access to the data that we need to continuously improve, but we are not making people or kids glued to their devices. We still want to build that human connection. It means that we can shape the future of learning together with teachers and students at the same time. And I'll talk a little bit more about some companies that are doing that so you can understand practically what it means. It means we can focus on core skills like caring for others, empathy building, listening, building those connections. If you think for a moment about your greatest learning moments, some may have happened at school, I am sure, but many happen outside of school. When you sit next to someone really interesting on a plane, although I am the person that reads books on planes, and do not talk to me. <laughs> um, but it might be sometime when you've traveled to a new country or when you went through a harrowing breakup or when you're parent fell sick, you had to rely on other things than those things that you learned in school. So what we strive to do and what we strive to think about is how do we make every single moment a learning moment and how can we use technology to track that? It's on and offline, like I mentioned, it doesn't just have to take place on your device. Let's step up and let's get away from our devices. And it focuses on 21st century skills. The future of learning focuses on 21st century skills. And I love this. I love it when people talk about the skills of tomorrow. I'm like, seriously, it's today. I don't know what the skills are. I mean it. I don't know. I can tell you one thing that I know, and that is the power of turning up. I want to understand what that means for me and for others, the power of turning up in any moment. And so when I think about these 21st century skills and these competencies, yes, by the way, this is a great graph. It's from a report by Microsoft, again, inspired by the Finnish education system. It's really amazing because it does identify some great concepts and some great core skills, which we can talk about. But it also looks at saying, what about turning up and what about being your best self? How can we, get you, how can we help you get there? So just some of those skills are learning how to learn building cultural competency, teaching multiliteracy, multi and self-care and self-management, which is so important, not just in the school, but also in the classroom. And you know, I really believe in taking this outside because that's where we are able to breathe and to expand. So when I was living in South Africa, I started a not-for-profit organization called Girls on Football. And what we did is we did workshops. We realized we could only reach X amount of girls per workshop, so we did a mobile health campaign. We were still very young at that time, but what it made me so excited was seeing that these girls across South Africa, we had 65,000 users on our platform. That was with Mixit back in the time, for those of you that remember, it was awesome. But these girls were engaging right away. They wanted to be heard. So that really opened my eyes to thinking about, okay, let's have these conversations. That's a great way technology can enable us to understand what's going on with our future, uh, with the youth of our future. So speaking of innovation in education, I just want to introduce you to some companies that are doing some really great things. Degreed is a 
an awesome company because they don't believe in degrees. They don't necessarily believe that you have to have a certain type of education to reach something. They believe in upskilling and teaching skills that matter. Now, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is Airtable. It helps make reading data really easy. My CTO is awesome, so he's great at this. Uh, for me, I'm more of a, I guess, visual thinker. I love languages too. So this is very helpful for me. He was like, are you really going to put that in there? I'm like, yes, some people need it. Um, and then Wonder School is one of my favorites. I really believe this is a way of thinking about teaching for the future. Big crisis, too many parents both have jobs, not enough nurseries, not enough quality um, primary education for kids. So Wonder School allows quality in-home child care with people that you trust. Awesome community-based solution, which doesn't use technology, but is still really fantastic. Reactor Fundamentals is really great. They have a an AI course that they launched. And I think within one month, 70,000 people signed up to be a part of this course, which is really great because it shows that people are interested in learning about what AI can mean for them and their organization. And moving on to a... Oh, yes, okay. So this is a, a really great platform as well. This is a mixed reality computer which was brought to classrooms to encourage avoiding isolated learning. So their approach to education is to avoid isolation by making experiences three-dimensional. And it's really interesting because, look, you can take this butterfly wing. Now, obviously, we're super lucky to be in this beautiful space now, so we can actually be around nature, but that's not always the case. So some really interesting examples of what's happening in education. So some of the work that we're currently doing, as I mentioned, artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence, which means a very, a very human approach to technology. So human-based tech. And what we do is we use artificial intelligence to tag all kinds of open education resources that are directly served to the learner when it matters most to them in a way that matters most to them. Now, what do I mean when I say open education resources? There's so much content out there already, right? There's so much. There's beautiful books. There's poetry. There's music. There's art. There's a lot of content out there. So we believe in using that content, tagging it by using conscious and agreeable measurements, and then serving it to the user at the right time. So the future of learning, and I'm going to leave a few minutes for questions because I'd love to hear what you're thinking, but here are just my thoughts on the future of learning. First of all, there are many ways to turn up and there are many ways in which education systems across the world differ. But I, ultimately, let's try and build a system that allows everybody to reach that passionate, purposeful reason why they are on earth. So how can we think about that? Well, one of the ways that I've thought about it, and I'm curious for your thoughts about this, we've got all that content, right? Documents, videos, music, art, so many ways to learn, so many exciting things to think about. We believe in applying cognitive AI on that so that we can tag it, understand it, read it, get it, use what we already have. Then we put that into a system that already understands the users based on their personality and based on their mindset. So that's something else that we measure. Then the teacher understands what's happening in that space, in that database that we've now tagged. The teacher also knows their students, so can help facilitate the journey. Now, what do you notice about this? That means that the teacher no longer holds the knowledge and disseminates it, but rather we have a way of saying, hey, here's a database of things that are really interesting. You might like it. Let me facilitate this learning for you. Oh, you're interested in elephants? Me too. Let's work on that. Oh, I see you're interested in relationships. Let's work on that. So teachers become almost like a mentor. And then we can take it even further. If we really think about what this could potentially mean, well, this is how I like to think about it. First of all, I think by reducing some of the thinking, some of the restrictions, we can look at finding more conscious consumerism. And why do I say that? Because happier people are less likely to overconsume, And we see that. I know, it's a, I know it's a big link, but we haven't been talking about big links all day, so I think you'll go here with me. Second thing is less medicine, because right now we have way too much unhappiness, and we're so dependent on drugs to get us through the day. When I say drugs, even though I'm Dutch, I meant medicine. Um, <laughs> What about the opportunity to build more spaces for creative thinking and opening spaces that don't just welcome the rhetoric of one or two groups of people? Because that's a real passion of mine is 
thinking about inclusive AI, because right now one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is that there's bias in AI and there's not enough people that are able to tackle this. So how can we make sure that going through methods of education, we can actually avoid that and give everybody more of an equal voice. We can also look at finding ways to build more ideas. What about Mo? What about Mo? Did Maybe he had the opportunity to have an awesome idea that would change this world. And I believe that everybody, honestly, I believe that everybody has that capacity and has deserves that opportunity. Now, really fun, my co-founder ran my speech through our AI, through our algos, and I was kind of anxious because I was like, oh, how is this going to come out? And I'm actually really excited about this because it told me that I talked about education, which I did, yes. Education psychology, the thinking behind it, learning teachers and skills. But this is even more fun. This is where it gets exciting. This is the emotional part. This is fun to measure for me and everyone's different. I like this. I like to think that there's joy in my presentation for you today. But yeah, there's sadness too. I'm sure you heard it. Fear. Disgust, disgust is a bit hectic, but, <laughs> and anger, yeah, I'm frustrated. I'm angry about some of the things that are very unequal in the world today that I believe need to be changed right now. So look at that awesome combination of artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence giving us some insight into what I've shared with you today. And I actually believe that in the future, my speech will be entirely decoded, put into a database, and then anybody who's interested, policymakers, government officials, teachers, can understand. And they can say, oh, I'm interested in those things, and I want to understand that better. And that's really exciting. If we can take that content and make it accessible, understandable, and traceable. So, as my co-founder says, teachers' roles are changing. They're more like masters that are going to show the force within each student. And I like thinking like that, too. It's about building those connections. It's about taking every single moment into a learning moment where really we, we relish emotion and we use technology to build strong solutions that help every learner become empowered to their full self. The most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you so much for your time.